all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Laura Lowe's. I am the chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department here in the College of Engineering at the University of Washington. Welcome to this, our first lecture in the fall 2019 engineering lecture se series. And it looks to be an excellent series with a wonderful lecture to start. By 2050, the world's population is projected to reach 9 billion, which is almost inconceivable. As a civil and structural engineer, I know that those 9 billion people will need buildings that are resilient to natural hazard events. They'll need transportation systems that enable them to visit their friends, family, and workplaces. And they'll need water. Water for drinking, clean water for drinking. They'll need water for agriculture, transportation, and tr uh, travel, but mostly they'll need water for food. And that may be food in the form of fish, fowl, soy, or rice, but food and water are an absolute necessity. Our speaker this evening, Professor Faisal Hossein, works in this research area. As, this nine, uh, as these nine billion people uh, come to need food and water, they're going to be faced with uh, food and water crises. Growing population, climate change are making it that much more difficult to have access to the water they need and, the f and therefore the food they need. And that water and food insecurity hits certain segments of the population, the disadvantaged segments, much harder than it will likely hit those of us here in this room. And the, uh, Professor Hossein is working to understand that problem better and to improve the methods and provide these populations with solutions to this growing crisis. His research focuses on hydrologic remote sensing, on water resource engineering, and on transboundary water management. He is a uh, incredibly valued member of our department, teaching classes at a variety of uh, levels, undergrad, graduate, and beyond, and also an incredibly valued member of his research community. He is currently the uh, scientific lead on the uh, on a research team that is working to establish requirements for the new surface water ocean topology satellite that will be launched by NASA in 2020. No introduction of Professor Hossein, however, would be uh, complete without commenting on the fact that in addition to helping to solve the world's water crisis, he's also a passionate filmmaker with uh, multiple films to his credit that have done the film circuit. So I'm not sure if he actually has any films in his presentation, but with uh, that introduction, I would like to welcome Professor Faisal Hossein. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Good evening. I want to thank the College of Engineering for organizing this lecture series. You know, one thing you've probably realized from Laura's talk is uh, we're engineers. And as engineers, one thing that we do that's in our DNA is we try to solve problems. So tonight, I want to talk to you about the current and emerging problem of food security as that applies to the region of Asia and um, try to share with you what we're trying to do uh, on that problem. So my goal will be to take you on a journey and share the lessons learned and um, the experiences we've gained when me, myself and some of my colleagues started working on this issue a few years ago. The first thing that I wanna talk about is farmer suicides. Some of you may have been reading it in the news especially in India, this has been happening at an epidemic rate. Since 1995, um, more than a quarter of a million people have ended their lives, uh, farmers. 
And what you see in front of you is basically a chart showing the six provinces of India that account for more than 80% of the farmer suicides. Now, these are marginal farmers with no disposable income. What that means is they're very vulnerable to crop failures. When a crop failure happens, it wipes out their livelihood. And if these farmers have taken a high interest loan, the thought of not being able to repay that often results in such a sad outcome. Um, you'll also notice that these top six provinces are not located or concentrated in one location of India. They're actually in all over India, those six locations. Now, the purpose of me starting off this way um, was to underscore the fact that food security is all about people and their livelihood, but more importantly, it's about the very people and their livelihood who are engaged in the profession of growing food, especially the marginal farmers. More often than not, if you ask me, I will tell you that in all this conversation about food security, we don't give farmers a voice or hear their perspectives, the marginal farmers, when it comes to building solutions. So in this rest of this talk, what I'll try to do is, when possible, I'll try to present that voice of the marginal farmers and try to show you how that's guiding our solution. I also want to talk to you about famines in Asia, in particular, two famines in the same region, South Asia and Eastern India and Bengal, that you know, could have been avoided if there had been universal access to information for everyone or better planning. One is on your left, the uh, Great Bengal Famine of 1942 to 43. This resulted in about one to two million people dying. And the uh, most uh, marginalized section of the society, those who had very little situational awareness, very little access to what was going on about what could be the expected food prices in future or that the crops were failing, they suffered most. As you can see from this picture on your left, the ones that are in the foreground, they suffered more. But if you see in the background, they're relatively better to do people who seem much healthier than the ones in front. By the way, my forefathers come from this region. That's why I'm sharing this with you. A couple of decades later, in 1974, the same situation repeated itself in Bangladesh. I don't know how many of you recall uh, George Harrison's song, um, concert in Madison Square, Bangladesh, or Joan Baez's song of that, but it was you know, right after a bloody war um, that killed a lot of people, but the economic system was in disarray. The agricultural system was in disarray. Food uh, crop failure hit the northern region, and the most illiterate, those who had very little idea of what was going on as far as food prices and food availability um, goes, they suffered the most. Now, fortunately, famines in Asia, at least, are a thing of the past. But that does not mean we can lower our guard and say, OK, the job is done. Because there's still a significant number of undernourished people in Asia. These are people who are not getting adequate calories to lead a healthy life. And what you see on the chart is, on the left side, it's in terms of millions. On the right's in terms of percentage of the total. You're looking at about 200 to 300 million people who are malnourished. Uh, I should say undernourished rather than malnourished. And if we're going to address this food security problem for Asia, I think the first thing that's worth looking at is, how are we doing in general when it comes to our food production system for the major crops? So here I'm showing you a map uh, in three basic colors for the three major crops, rice, maize, and wheat. Uh, green represents regions where you have good agricultural productivity. You're getting close to the maximum yield. Blue means, uh, or red means your fertilizing is not optimum, either too much or too little. Blue means your fertilizers and your irrigation is not optimum. You're either applying too much or too little. And what you see is that, obviously, Western Europe is all green. That's great. China for rice is green. But in South Asia and Southeast Asia, you see a lot of red and blue. Especially for wheat, you see a lot of blue in India. So one thing that all crops need is water. So it's worth looking into 
how are we using the water? Are we using it efficiently enough? Are we using it to the maximum possible limit to grow as much as we can? So I'll show you some numbers here. You see for the three more populous nations of Asia, China, India, and Pakistan, um, the combined population, I believe, is more than 2.8 billion. One, what you'll see here is that China seems to be doing the better or the best of these three nations. Uh, on an average for these major crops, cereal crops, for every meter cube of water, unit of water, they're getting close to almost a kilogram of these staple food. India is second, but not as good as China, and Pakistan is really dismally low, uh, 0.13 kilogram, like barely a hundred grams uh, of food. And that is manifested on that map on your right. Uh, what you see there is basically in terms of irrigated water that is being used to grow the same kilocalorie of food. The more red that map is, it means the more inefficient the irrigation system is. So you see in Western India or Pakistan along the river, or even some places in the Middle East, very red, very inefficient. So the question becomes then, as my talk is titled is, because there is room for improvement, definitely you can see in these Asian countries, you know, other countries are doing pretty well, why not these other countries like Pakistan and India, why cannot they do as well as the China, say for example? So our question is then, can we grow more with less? And less means less water. Um, there could be two ways or three ways of doing it. One is to kind of uh, make your water use more efficient, uh, get away, be done with your losses, uh, or uh, in, invest in better seeds and fertilizers so that for the same amount of water you get more food, or a combination of both. Here what I want to do is I want to share with you our experiences with Pakistan, because recall from the previous slide, this country had the lowest water use productivity, about 0.13 kilogram per food. And it happens to have the world's largest irrigation system that you see in front of you. There are five rivers starting from the north. They're fed by the Hindukush Himalayan mountains, the glaciers. They meet somewhere in the middle and become Indus River. The colored region represents the command area of the irrigation system. And the water is brought to the farmers through a series of crisscrossing canals. And each color represents a cropping pattern. So if you see purple on the south, it is basically a pattern or a cropping pattern where you will grow wheat alternated with cotton. If you see green a uh, little bit upstream in the north, it's um, rice with cotton. So it's a very centrally planned, well-managed irrigation system. It's all based on surface water, no groundwater system. It's been operating since the British era. In fact, I think the British designed it. And it's, it's still the um, cornerstone of this country's food supply. However, by the way, I should also mention that if you happen to be visiting that place um, in any particular growing season, you will see the same crop being grown for tens or hundreds of miles. It's kind of like being in Iowa or Indiana where you see corn all over the place. So it's very similar. It's a very large scale system. However, um, if you look into how the system was designed, it was really designed for one crop a year, additional crop for which the surface water was really fine because you didn't have so much need for food. There were population in the 1950s was about 34 million people. Reality today is this system is being used two to three times more its design limit, for which the surface water is just not enough because the population has, as Laura mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, it's been going up in Pakistan's case, it's, I think it's increased eightfold. And obviously when surface water is not enough, what are the farmers doing? For the water that they think the crops need, for the other seasons, they're pumping it from the ground. Let's talk about rice, for example. Rice in any irrigation system, especially in Asia, typically will uh, comprise the lion's share of the crop water need. In the case of Pakistan, you know, the Indus Basin irrigation system, it's about 60%. If you look at how much rice needs for one particular season, say in a province like Punjab, which is um, humid, a little cooler, it's about 600 millimeters for that 120 days of growing season of rice, that's typical in South Asia. In Sindh, which is drier, um, hotter, it's naturally a little higher. 
But if you document how much the farmers are applying, they're applying two to three times more, way more than what the crops need. And this, that additional water that they're applying is really coming from the ground uh, sources. So it results in tremendous loss of water. Every year the water table seems goes down, which means the next year you have to pump the water from a deeper depth, more fuel cost. And we keep hearing from the farmers that we work with is that, um, you know, uh, the profit margins are going down because they need to spend more on fuel to pump the same amount of water. Now, there are many, I think, negative effects of doing anything too much, such as, you know, over irrigation. The one negative impact of over irrigation that I want to stress uh, is when you do excessive irrigation, the nutrients in the top soil will leach further down below and become unavailable for the roots of the crop which means your soil productivity, your crop productivity will go down. So there's another reason not to over-irrigate. Overall, uh, this region, this irrigation system in Pakistan, and you know, what, what our uh, colleagues tell us all the time is, the water use efficiency for rice is really quite low. Um, world average is way better, uh, close to 700 grams of kilogram of rice, um, 0.71 kilogram of rice for every meter cube of water. In Pakistan, the average seems to be about 450 grams, but there are many places where it's a dismal, barely 100 grams or 0.08 kilogram for every meter cube of water. That's where a lot of wastage of groundwater is happening. So then our problem statement is, how do we change the farmer's mindset and tell them that they don't need to irrigate so much when there's an opportunity not to irrigate? How do we in, uh, initiate a change in behavior? And whatever solution that is, how do you make sure that solution is sustainable and affordable? This is key. If you're gonna make any solution last there, it has to be sustainable and affordable. Before we proceed any further, I think it's worth reflecting why farmers are over irrigating in the first place. So if you try to get to the bottom of the issue, at the core of the issue, really, you know, the saying is old habits die hard. Um, what's really been happening is in the 1950s, surface water was plenty, food demand wasn't so much. The current fathers and grandfathers, uh, the fathers and grandfathers of current farmers, they use water liberally, oftentimes flood irrigation. That practice has stayed on. And in developing countries, farming practice gets handed down from one generation to another. My own father was a farmer until high school, and um, he tells me that it's really based on what people share on farm from one generation to the next. So the current farmers who's, uh, who grew up watching their fathers and forefathers doing this doing flood irrigation or using water liberally think that they need to do the same thing. Naturally, therefore, when they want to use water liberally, when there's not enough from the surface water, they're pumping it from the ground. So it's a generational habit that's been handed down, and we need to address that through a very cost-effective solution. I think this is also a good time for me to share with you a little story on how we got involved in this research in the first place. So uh, there's this satellite called GRACE you see on your right, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. It's essentially a twin satellite system that flies around the Earth. It measures gravity changes. And those gravity changes are related to changes in water mass. And if you do some further manipulation, you can relate it to, in a qualitative sense, changes in groundwater mass. So my colleague, the map that you see on your left, Matthew Rodell and his colleagues at NASA, he had used at that time seven years of data to publish a work in Nature that went viral where he had shown that the region of Western India had been or had undergone gone, massive depletion of its groundwater resources. This is something you can see in the plot uh, on the left side, the, um, the, the figure on the right. So what happens when you publish research on a water issue that is pretty contentious, that happens to be in a region of a nuclear powered country? But also, that's a region that is bordering with another nuclear part country who are bitter rivals. The other country, that nuclear part country, gets alerted. And that's when they start contacting us. This agency, which is the country's top federal agency, PCRWR, 
Pakistan Council for Research and Water Resources. They start writing to us because they had seen this work. It went viral, it got a lot of press coverage, and they were wanting to know how they could use the gray satellite data to see what's going on in their country across the border. Um, they felt like if it's happening to Western India, it's likely happening to Pakistan. And they don't really have a good enough ground network. They felt like this satellite data could help them understand as a first cut what's going on, where there's, there's storage or where there's a lot of depletion and all that. Some even at this agency said, no, it's more urgent than that. India could be stealing our water because they have a gradient to their advantage. And since we can't build an impervious wall underground along the border, we're probably losing our water to India. So anyway, the point they made was that we really want to be able to study this and build capacity to use the data to see what's going on in our country. Long story short, in 2016, through a series of collaborations, research activities, a lot of it supported by UW, Global Affairs, and other agencies, that agency, PCRWR, that I just talked to you about, uh, managed the ability to produce maps like this that you see on your right. These are qualitative maps. It's monthly snapshot telling you uh, the regions that are gaining in groundwater versus regions that are losing in groundwater. And they uh, can use this to kind of understand what's going on. We also did a study with them using ground networks um, of piezometers, those are groundwater wells. And the estimates we came up with by combining it with satellite data is that that region that you see on your right, there is a net loss happening. Every year it's losing probably somewhere from half to one and a half cubic kilometer of water. And they can say that that is entirely due to over irrigation during the winter season. To put it in perspective, Grand Coulee Dam's total storage across the mountains in eastern Washington is 11 cubic kilometers. So you can look at this system as like the current state, business as usual, this system every maybe 10 years or 15 years probably is losing one Grand Coulee Dam of water completely from its ground system. So the agency said, okay, now that we can do this, but we haven't solved the, all the other pieces of the puzzle, we need to um, get to information to the farmers to tell them how to irrigate or when to irrigate. We need to know what the crops need. So that involved basically estimating for the entire country the crops need for water, which we call it crop water demand or evapotranspiration, ET. There are many methods for that. One common method we use for water management is called the FAO 56, you see here. At the equation you see on your right, um, it needs a bunch of different inputs. And these are basically inputs you would get from a weather station or a MET station. However, if you want to do it for the entire country, every day, routinely, for every single pixel, it's hard. The good news is, you can rewrite this equation in terms of easier to measure practical inputs that I've shown you below, like temperature, wind speed, humidity, um, location, and all that. And the even better news is these easy to measure or easy to observe atmospheric variables are routinely predicted of their current state, of their historical state, even back to the last 50 years called reanalysis, or their future state um, at the weather scale, one to 15 day lead time, by a combination of global atmospheric models and global Earth observing satellites. The, uh, the atmospheric models here are numerical weather prediction models. And this data is free. It's at scales of 10 to 25 kilometer, but it's not being used as widely as it could be for developing regions. It's being used a lot in developed countries, but not in developing regions. So the idea we had was as follows. We have the Earth observing satellites. They can't forecast anything, but they can see what happened or what's, what happened in the past if it's been flying over there. It can tell us, you see on your upper right, um, current conditions of rainfall or crop water needs, ET, or historical if you want. Then we can use the atmospheric models that you see on the lower uh, part that can tell us current conditions of rainfall and also crop water demand. And then you can combine the two to do a demand and supply analysis. So what that means is that your demand is the crop ET, your supply is um, your uh, rainfall, 
or your recent irrigation where if you've done any excess irrigation, it would stay on the soil layer, so it would be as a reservoir. And then what you do is you fire these uh, farmers. Here you see a picture of a farmer looking at his phone, checking a text message. So you fire this text message. I believe he's not taking a selfie. He's checking, I mean, his text message. That's what we were told. So you can tell them when to irrigate or when not to irrigate. So we decided to bring that solution to the farmers directly, like this. So you see on the right hand side in the local language there in Pakistan, the messages. And almost all farmers have flip phones or smartphones, and it's not hard to get text messages there. It would be something like, dear farmer, I would like to tell you that such and such and such, your crop doesn't need that, or dear farmer, your banana crop needs this. And the stakeholder agency we're working with, PCRWR, they know who is growing what, what the growth stage is, all that. So they will then create these messages. We just provide them the back end of it. What's not shown here is a forecast component to these advisories, like what to expect for the coming week. We added that. And that was in highest demand because farmers, I mean, current conditions, they can see it for themselves. They don't need a text message for that. But they really cared about what to expect the coming week to see if they could avoid irrigation or if they would need irrigation. So we piloted the system in 2016 with humble beginnings. But as we carried on, it surprisingly scaled up very fast to 100,000 farmers. So today it's serving about 100,000 farmers. And we started getting a lot of positive feedback or just feedback in general from the farmers. Uh, I can't share all of them, but the one that I really like that I want to talk to you about is this farmer who owns a 12 acre land. His name is Mohammed Ashraf. He called us on such and such date. And initially he was a little skeptical about the system. His neighboring farmers didn't even go for it. He um, decided to give it a try. He was doing winter wheat at that time. That's the time for harvest. And normally in that region, they follow a calendar that's really fixed, maybe from their fathers or from the British era, that's never been updated, where typically they would do six or seven applications of irrigation. According to our messaging, he could skip four. And one thing he noticed is that, as you see in his message, is that he got better yield than his neighboring farmers. But more importantly, he was able to save on fuel costs because he didn't have to pump that groundwater. So overall, his profit margin was higher. So I believe that's how, you know, system got scaled up. And it went from, you know, 700 to 100,000 farmers today. I think the lesson learned here is that for any low cost system, you don't hit zero to 60 right away. You need to be patient. You need to do the, uh, make sure the system does its job and it produces good results. And once it does, you know, other farmers can see. Uh, and then seeing is believing, and that's the only way farmers build trust in the system. And then from word of mouth, it scales up. I think that's what we learned trying to do this um, in, in this case. The agency also helped us do some quantitative impact evaluation, uh, where basically we want to assess, okay, what is its impact re really? So one impact they came up with was that this system currently seems to be saving about two and a half billion meter cube of water uh, on an average for 100,000 farmers, which is about two and a half cubic kilometer of water. Again, put it in perspective, Grand Coulee Dam, total storage is 11 cubic kilometer. So you can think of this as every five years or four years, if you have this system running, you're probably saving one Grand Coulee Dam of water being lost to you know, other sources, it's staying in the system. Now recall from the previous numbers that I shared with you, the net loss was 0.5 to 1.5 cubic kilometers, so this can result in a net gain. So what this can allow is, it can give the groundwater system a breathing space to build up its stock with each year's monsoon rain. You know, those decades of overuse and misuse could be undone probably with a system like this. It would take a while, but it can happen. Uh, in general, the impact evaluation told us that the savings is about 40%. Unfortunately, not all the farmers were using this messaging system. Only 80% were. The other 20% were like me. They hate text messages. Um, we don't blame them. It's, that's the nature of things. And anecdotally, we heard that farmer income had increased anywhere from 50 to 100%. So one thing I mentioned is that 
the solution that we want to go for has to be not only affordable, but sustainable. So sustainability of the solution means there should be good building of capacity of the stakeholder agency and technology transfer. So fortunately, this system, uh, the federal government of Pakistan, they prioritized it. They opened from their own permanent budget line, staff positions like you see here on your left, um, IT people, agronomists, they invested in the hardware, and whatever system we co-developed with them, it, they've been owning it and running it and modifying it on their own since 2018. That way, we could be in the business of getting out of business. That way, we were made redundant, which is great because then we could focus on the next problem and take a stab at trying to solve it, such as going further east, India. So India is now a lot more interesting. Um, not only because it's a big, vast country, you have a lot more farmers there. 140 million, just you think about it. And most of them are marginal farmers, 65% according to some sources. I've heard numbers as high as 82% that are marginal farmers. Marginal means, again, small plot of land, no disposable income. Also, India doesn't have one big giant irrigation system like you saw for Pakistan, like IBIS. The other thing is, given how much the plots vary with the crop type and everything and the variability, the system we used for Pakistan is not going to work in India. Um, the scales of 10 to 25 kilometer just won't get what these farmers need. And you can see that for yourself. Uh, the picture on, on the top, you see the farmer getting his land ready for rice transplantation from the nursery but someone behind him is growing vegetables. If you don't believe me, I will show you this plot, uh, which shows the variability of your, uh, the, uh, you know, the crops, the plot size. So this length of this rectangle is one kilometer. Inside, there's a little white box that's 250 meters. And you see all these small plots of different shapes and sizes, weird shapes and sizes, where everybody's growing their own little thing. You know, um, spring onion, harvested cotton, or um, rice, and all that. So the bottom line is, for these farmers, you have to give something that's more locally uh, resolved, more plot scale relevant. And that's, that's the challenge we have, is we can't just give them a 10 or 25 kilometer thing, because in Pakistan it worked, because when somebody's growing cotton, they're growing cotton for tens and hundreds of miles. And uh, we could kind of stick with that. Also, our system needs to be affordable. We're not sitting on billions of dollars where we could invest in lots and lots of drones, do hyperspectral imagery and all that. Um, great as it would be, but it won't be sustainable, right? So then we thought is, okay, what could we do? Turns out, we, have, we live in this day and age of the internet. And there's this thing called Internet of Things. So this is all second-hand knowledge I gained working with my colleagues, my sensor people and equipment people. And there's this thing called Internet of Things, IoT. And there's this thing called Low Power Wide Area Network. It's kind of like your own wireless network, except that it needs very little power. I mean, it can run on a solar panel or a battery, but it has low bandwidth and not that far wide reception. So what you see here in front of you is on the left, you see an environmental sensor. Um, it's a IoT-compatible water level sensor. It runs on two AA batteries. It can run for a couple of years. That's what I've been told. We've been changing batteries every six months, but they say two, months, uh, two years is fine. And this will record water levels or whatever that it's designed to record. But it won't store it. It will relay it directly to this. What you see in the middle plot is a router, a low power wide area, LP1 router. Just like the routers you see here, there are probably a few, I think. But it's low power, low bandwidth. You would put it on a treetop or a tower. That runs on a solar panel. And that won't even record the data. It would push it to the internet, to the cloud. So everything is getting pushed to the cloud. So in a sense, this is a very um, cheap, affordable system, but also low maintenance. I kind of like to draw the analogy of your smart home security system. If you have one, you may have noticed that there are these little sensors you put on the doors and windows. And if you've ever changed the battery, it's a battery of a watch. You don't need changing it for a couple of years. The last time I changed mine, I can't remember when. And when there's a security breach, there's a sound made, 
Nothing is recorded, but that is relate to your local little pad in your house. And that pad doesn't record everything. It pushes it to the cloud. And you can access that on an app, on your phone, or through the internet, right? Same idea that we're trying to shoot for, keeping things cheap and affordable. So you see here on the left is a IoT compatible soil moisture sensor. In the middle is a integrated weather and soil sensor. And on the right is a poor man's weather station made IoT compatible. So the idea we had is like this. We're going to integrate all the locally um, resolvable conditions of the land, like soil moisture or temperature or wind speed that we need at scales finer than 10 kilometers using our IoT sensors. You see on the upper left, see these are all relaying. And then that would relay to the local low powered wide area network tower. And the tower would collect all that and push it to the cloud. The same cloud you have the coarse resolution system you see on your right, the satellites and the, earth, um, the weather models. And then you combine everything and go down the scale, disaggregate, and try to give uh, the farmer something that's more plot scale, more relevant to what they're doing. So this is how PANI was born. PANI is an acronym for Provision for Advisor and Necessary Irrigation. We came up with the idea. But the reason why we came up with PANI is PANI in the local vernacular also means water, in, both in my own mother tongue and both in Hindi and many languages. Um, so what PANI does is it retains the same course resolution system you see on the upper left. On the right, it takes the localized information at, say, scales of a kilometer or so from the IoT sensors. It also needs geodatabases on the soil um, type, soil health, or plot size, plot shape, location, uh, which, by the way, in India, the government is doing a fantastic job of digitizing for the whole country and making it available. It's just amazing what they have done with soil health cards and land records. It's all publicly available as GIS databases. Then you combine everything, and you fire. I'm using the same picture, but you fire those plot advisories uh, plot scale advisor to the farmer. I have to acknowledge my, uh, our partners here, which is IIT Kanpur, the, uh, some startup and companies who are helping us out in this. So how affordable is Pani? You know, we, I kept saying it's cheap, doesn't need much power. So we did the numbers. And what we found out is that, say, one LP1 tower with the, uh, not the tower, the gateway with the router would cost about $900. You need some sensors. Uh, you need some soil moisture sensors and an integrated weather module. And you know, this is a low powered wide area network. It's not like your traditional wireless network that's high bandwidth 4G or 3G or 5G. It also doesn't have much of a reception. Like it may be go up to 10 kilometers um, reception. But we're being conservative here. Um, we're saying that it can cover about 100 square kilometers. But no, those, that area has to have clear line of sight between the router and the sensor. And you won't get that everywhere because you may have houses, you may have trees, you may have hills. So we're being very conservative, assuming that, OK, let's assume one tower can get us 100 square kilometers of good reception where there is no dead zones like you see those ads in Verizon, right? Um, and then we're also assuming that uh, you need about one sensor per square kilometer. And if you assume that there are about 100 farmers living in one square kilometer, which is a fairly representative um, density, at least in northern India, then the setup cost comes out to be $5 a year. We think it's very affordable and if you put it in the context of what the average farmer income is. In fact, our uh, interviews with the farmers, uh, marginal farmers have told us that they would be willing to pay this amount for this service right away if we could provide it as a standard service. So we just finished piloting the system. Just this May 2019, we started it in November during the winter wheat season with our colleagues in India, in northern India. So that's near Kanpur. Um, it's a local uh, region in a basin that had instruments. So we set up the Pani system and we piloted 450 wheat growing farmers. And what you see on the right is these messages they were getting in the local language Hindi. The first part is weather advisory because they're interested in knowing what the weather conditions would be like, especially the forecast. The lower part is the irrigation advisory. But the one thing that I want to stress to you is that it's very important, especially with marginal farmers, to give them an advisory that's compatible with their 
way of life, with, with their practice. So there, you know, if you're giving them an advice, you're like, okay, you gotta irrigate 2.6789 centimeters of water, it doesn't mean anything. Nobody can ensure that, even we know it in engineering terms. They do it using units of finger, one finger, two finger, three finger. Pakistanis, by the way, do it this way. I guess they have to be different from the Indians to do it like the markings of the finger. <laughs> so you have to know that. Because there was a lot of debate on what do they mean by a finger, so what do we mean by a finger? So a lot of effort went into serving the farmers and trying to get to the bottom of what exactly is that, that they would understand. So that engagement interaction is very critical. You know, awareness, building a goodwill, and then taking feedback, going back to the drawing board, figuring out how you should uh, draft your messages or what exactly do they need, telling them what's in it, in, in it for them, all that. And we just got our hands on the results uh, so the feedback just came back this summer of 2019, so I'm sharing it for the first time with you. What you see on the right is just a sample of some of how the farmers look like in that region, you know, uh, from the 150 farmers. And the first thing that I want to talk to you about is 15% of the farmers said, oh, we don't like this system, we don't need this system. Now, recall from the Pakistan system, we had about 20% of the people saying, uh, this is not for me, I'm not interested, I'm not gonna do anything to it. Maybe because they don't like text messages or maybe because they don't see any benefit. I think for a system that you're trying to aim for as low cost and you're aiming for scale and for the masses, this number is fine. If you wanna improve this number 15% and bring it down, you have to be careful because that's when you add complexity to the system. That's when costs go up and the net benefit can go down. Not only that, you may risk alienating the remaining farmers who found this system appealing because of its simplicity. So that's something to keep in mind for us. We've seen a lot of apps and irrigation advisories going almost becoming a failure because they went for too much complexity in their system. So for the remaining 85% who found the system useful, we asked them further, what exactly did you do? Or how exactly did it benefit you? So we got these numbers. Uh, you see on the upper right, about one fourth of them changed the irrigation date. So in that region, you know, there is a local irrigation system, there's an irrigation department, they run and maintain a series of canals. And farmers follow a fixed irrigation calendar that's never been updated since the British era. However, the canals never supply water when the crops need it, it doesn't show up on time. So farmers do their own on-farm irrigation. So they use the Pani messages to come up with their own calendar and irrigate. Uh, some of them, if you look at the lower right, they were able to skip. Some were a little clever. They decided to pick the date for fertilizers so they wouldn't burn out the crops. And overall, what you see is that it really resulted in a net reduction in over-irrigation or irrigation. We tracked the yield, and what we found out is that the yield for yeet, wheat was about 4,000 to 5,000 kilograms per hectare. Now, unfortunately, we're not there the previous year, so we've never tracked the yield individually for the same farmers, but if you pull historical records from the government, you see that that region has a yield of about 3,000, a little under 3,000 kilograms per hectare. I wanna put it in perspective because yield in general has been going up for wheat in India with uh, better seeds, better fertilizers, better practices. But overall, we believe that this really big improvement in the yield you see from what the historical average is, is really because of efficient uh, optimization of irrigation and trying to grow more with less water, you know, by avoiding unnecessary irrigation. We also learned a few other lessons for example, potato growers, we had no idea we had potato growers among our mixed mist. Apparently, a lot of the wheat farmers were forwarding their messages to the potato growers, and some of the wheat farmers were moonlighting as potato growers, I guess. So we only learned when we stopped the messaging in May, because they called us and complained to us, why did you stop it? So we restarted it, but we asked them, why do you need it so much? They told us that they're really worried about, one thing they're worried about is blight. So I'm no potato expert, by the way, um, so a little, any one potato that gets a little fungal attack, it damages the entire crop. And the way blight happens is excessive moisture, over-irrigation, temperatures being cool, humidity being high, all that stuff. So they really cared about 
situations where they could avoid irrigating if it was supposed to rain or if the conditions would be cool. So that was a good finding. The other thing we found out is that normally we were giving these farmers a weather forecast, uh, hoping that it would be handy for them for figuring out pollination or pest ma management needs and all that. But one interesting thing we found out by interviewing the farmers is that a lot of the farmers cared about temperature and humidity forecast during the sowing and the harvesting season. When we asked them why, they told us that that's the time when they have to hire on-farm labor. And they want to make sure that they can make that hired labor work as long as possible because time is money. And they want to make sure that the conditions are ideal for working as long as possible, both for them and for the hired on-farm labor. So that was an interesting perspective. You know, normally we engineers in our ivory tower normally don't think about all these issues. So it turned out that we have to have these and improve on their skill when possible. Some, as you see, they're like me. They prefer the good old-fashioned phone. They don't like text messages. So we're working on it. There's a voice-based thing you can do, automated. Um, the text message could be converted into your audio messages. I think a lot of iPhones can do the other way around. Your voice message can get transcribed. Same concept. And like I mentioned, the central irrigation system that the lo localities are using and the irrigation department that's managing it, I think Pani can modernize it for them because Pani can tell them what region needs or what plot needs water when, and they can make sure that the canals are providing the water at that time rather than following this fixed irrigation calendar that's never been updated. So what's next? Buoyed by the initial success of the piloting, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to expand it to 50,000 farmers this year and next year. Our goal is 50 million in five years from now. And why not? Prime Minister Narendra Singh Modi has declared that he wants farmer income doubled by 2024. So it's a good time. There's a big government system working, and there are a lot of opportunities for that to be ambitious and try different ideas. But the other thing is we're actually going further east and scaling this or piloting this to Bangladesh with about 250 farmers. And in fact, it's five days from now. We're doing that launch with the ribbon cutting thing. Um, of these 250 farmers, you have uh, crash crops like uh, mangoes, aromatic rice, pulses. But the interesting part of that is we're actually targeting a lot of farmers who live in the coastal region. Uh, the farmers in the coastal region told us that they would be interested in trying this out. And when we asked them why, what they told us is, you know, Bangladesh has been a poster child of climate change, sea level rise. Many of you know that. Um, they told us that the naturally occurring water on the ground or underground is brackish. So you really can't use it for growing food. So the window, the season where the fresh water is from the skies, from the heavens, which is enough for that season. But then for other seasons, what they do is they harvest the rainwater in little dugout ponds and pitchers. And then during the dry season in winter, they use it very wisely, very sparingly. And so they were really interested in seeing if it could even help them be more water wise and more efficient. So we're interested in trying it out and we'll see where that takes us. Just, excuse me, I need to irrigate myself a little bit. Um, one more thing. We're also thinking if smart can be smarter. I mean, the word term smart, it's it's been around, it's getting a little stale, I think. So we thought, can we make it even smarter? What we mean by that is, if you look on the right side, there's this smart irrigation system. We're calling it smart. It's running in Pakistan, so finger, uh, farmers can see when not to irrigate or how to do their crop management and all that, rather than going by intuition or what they learned from their far fathers. However, right now, that's a service. So that has an operational cost. Right now, the Pakistan government is paying about $10,000 a year for the SMS texting. It costs more to do it in a local language than it does in English. Ideally, they would like to reach to 3 million farmers, but that's not happening anytime soon until a business model or revenue model gets in place with the private sector. So then the question becomes is, of these you know, 3 million farmers, which are the top or most important 100,000 farmers you want to make sure they get the message as a service, as a free service? so that your impact is maximum, maybe in terms of yield, livelihood, water sustainability, and all that. Do we sample the farmers randomly, or do we just let them come, and whoever comes first gets the service? I think this is where the gray satellite I told you about can make things 
smarter. It can make smart irrigation smarter. And so we're toying with this idea, and the idea is like this. You have the GRACE satellite on the right, and using that, the agency is able to, the country's agency is able to generate these maps on the middle, qualitative maps, every month showing where the recharge and the decline is. So if you collect a few months of these maps, you can easily figure out the regions that are declining faster than they should be or then uh, you know, the rate at which they would get recharged from the next year's monsoon. And you can then target those regions and those are the regions where the farmers could be getting these messages. That way, those farmers there where they're over-irrigating probably and where the groundwater is declining, they can get messages on how to be water-wise. So the groundwater system or the groundwater stocks in those regions that you see in circles can get some breathing space to build up its stock with the following year's monsoon. So that's the idea we have. And uh, even if the GRACE data is not exactly accurate, if you can create such snapshots, the agency can send people to verify if that region, the water table has gone really deep or fast than what it should be. And then accordingly, they can fire these messages. So it would save them a lot of manpower. It would help them prioritize the smart irrigation system. So I'm coming to an end of my talk, and I want to leave you with three take-home messages that I hope you can remember by the time you get back home and think about it. First is freely available satellite data and numerical weather models. They're low-hanging fruits. They're not being used as much as they should be in the developing region. They're being used a lot in developed countries, but in developing regions, they have the biggest bang for the buck. If we want to think about feeding Asia because of the significant number of undernourished people uh, and number of marginal farmers, we have to empower the marginal farmers. So any solution for food security when it's related to Asia, I believe it has to represent the voice of the marginal farmer. So I'm a big fan of that. And I believe that oftentimes when we disregard the voice of the marginal farmer, we're not making a solution that's sustainable. The last one is technology that's precise and smart. It doesn't have to be expensive. There's this internet of things. There's this low-powered wide area network. So with that, I want to acknowledge my sponsors, my stakeholder agencies, a lot of them. I tried to fit them all in. My students, I hope I didn't miss any students if they happen to be here. Um, collaborators, really a lot, so I just put dot, dot, dot here. And with that, I would thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.